Great. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much to the organisers for setting up this very nice workshop. Um, so I'm going to talk about roughly these several papers um, uh, from the last couple of years, um, all of which have something to do in some capacity with topologically massive gauge theory and topologically massive gravity and their double copy. Um, so I'm not going to bother motivating you with the usual uh, why the double copy is interesting or anything like that, but because uh, I think you've probably heard it enough uh, over the recent very nice talks. So I'm just going to motivate it with a little example, which is we'll, we'll just consider this. So I'm, I'm going to cons consider this biojoint scalar in two plus one dimensions. So it's a massive biojoint scalar in two plus one dimensions. Um, and the only thing that's slightly strange about it is that it's gauged in one of the color sectors. So the unbarred uh, color sector isn't gauged, but it's gauged with respect to the uh, unbarred. Did I just say that right? Whatever. Um, and this gives this equation of motion. Um, now, the simplest thing that you could imagine doing when it comes to color kinematic duality is just taking color index and replacing it with the Lorentz index, right? So, for example, you could just replace A bar with mu, B bar with mu, C bar with rho, or something like that. And this would, you know, change this equation of motion. And in four dimensions, for, for m equals zero, you find that doing this gives what's known as the second order Yang Mills equations of motion. And this was shown in this. Uh, 2021 paper. Um, so now you can ask the question, what happens in three dimensions with uh, the mass turned on? So if we just do this, we end up with an equation of motion like this. Um, and now we need to identify what this um, new structure constant is, right now that has kinematic indices. And if you just look at the Lorentz algebra in two plus one dimensions, um, this thing turns out to be minus epsilon mu nu uh, rho. And in fact, you could have just guessed this anyway, because this is a completely anti-symmetric three form and three dimensions. Therefore, it has to be proportional to the levy tributa. And you just find that the coefficient happens to be minus one by looking at the uh, Lorentz algebra, which is obviously a, a kinematic algebra. Um, you then have to identify this field with something and in three dimensions, the most natural thing to identify this field with is the dual of the field strength. And that gives you this equation, which happens to be the second order equation of motion for a topologically massive gauge theory. So we've started with a biojoint scalar. We've just done the dumbest, most naive thing possible and changed one of the color indices to a Lorentz index, and we've landed on a topologically massive gauge theory. So what is a topologically massive gauge theory? Um, it is a gauge theory where, in again, in two plus one dimensions, it's got a Yang-Mills piece, normal Yang-Mills piece, plus uh, a Chern-Simons piece. So this is a standard Chern-Simons gauge theory. And, you know, if you saw uh, Henrik's talk, uh, you would have might recognize this piece from that. And there's an associated gravitational uh, topologically massive theory uh, which is roughly given by the same thing, an Einstein gravity piece and uh, a gravitational Chern-Simons piece. What's interesting about these theories is that they are massive, but they're fully gauge invariant in the sense that um, up to a uh, surface term, these guys, this action is fully gauge invariant despite having a mass. Uh, they only describe one spin, so either plus or minus uh, one or two, depending on whether or not it's gauge of gravity. Uh, and it's basically um, depends on the sign of this M in the action. Um, matter particles coupled to the 
to this either this gauge boson or this graviton that you get from these guys are called anions. So they're either gravitational anions or uh, regular anions. And we want to scatter those guys, see what happens. So we're going to use spinnerlicity formalism in three dimensions. So first thing to note is there is no chirality in two plus one dimensions. Uh, so there are no dotted indices. There are only undotted indices. Um, you have to choose some particular representation of your uh, Lorentz group. So we're going to choose SL2R, um, which means that our momenta, when you hit it with these guys, are going to be real. But these individual spinners uh, need not be real. Now, this, um, if P squared is zero, then we just have the outer product of two identical spinners. Uh, if the momentum is massive and P squared is non-zero, then we have uh, a spinner and its barred cousin. And the spinners look like this. So in the massless case, in the SL2R representation, they are real. But in the massive case, they're not real and they're not real exactly by this um, sign, well, by the fact that the mass is um, has an I in front of it and that the sign of the mass um, is different between different uh, spinners. Now, I told you before that the sign of the mass is the thing that determines the helicity. So these guys can be thought of as a, you know, this can be, this is a negative helicity guy, if you like, and the barred spinner is a positive helicity guy. And if you dot these guys together, um, you find that the inner product is given by 2IM in this representation. In other representations, it's always proportional to M, but in other representations, the fact is different. Um, I, I mention this because if you look in some of those papers, uh, we've used different representations depending on the scenario. So you can also define a polarization vector. So this is actually a gauge fixed polarization vector. You needn't gauge fix, you could uh you know have a an eta here and then a q eta in the in the denominator like you like you might in four dimensions but prefer to work with this gauge fixed version um, and this guy solves the equations of motion that you get for topologically limited gauge theory um for example one thing to note is that um if you're used to spinner helicity in four dimensions this guy is related by just setting one of the momentum components to N. So you just take a four dimensional spinner, set one of the momentum components to N, um, and you find you immediately get a massive three dimensional spinning helicity variable. Um, of course, the square brackets come with dotted indices. So we need something to, we need an operator if you want to do dimensional reduction on those guys, we need an operator that turns those um, into the opposite chirality spinners. So we define the bar as being some operator that acts on a square bracket. And then we set the, the relevant component to be the mass. And we find that this is the correct choice for this particular operator. Uh, and we can, for example, act on some bi spinner and it projects out the mass. And therefore, the three dimensional momentum is now just given by this operator acting on a four dimensional momentum, symmetrizing and setting the relevant components to M. So having got these spinalisty variables, um, we can use little group scaling because, as I told you, that these these guys uh, represent the different helicity choices. Uh, so, you know, an angle without a bar is negative helicity, an angle with a bar is positive helicity. So these things carry little group weight of half or minus a half or plus half. So we know that the amplitude has to transform, um, you know, in the, in the usual way under little group scaling. Therefore, um, any self-interacting set of three particles can be written like this. Um, because this has the correct little group scaling. However, I told you before that we can just do dimensional reduction on spinners. So this thing ought to be equal to um, the usual three particle amplitude that we have um, in 
so-called part Taylor form in four dimensions. And indeed, these things are equal by the Schouten identity. Um, now, the fact that these are equal by the Schouten identity is actually quite interesting because this is the guy that comes from uh, a Yang Mills vertex, right? Um, whereas this is, well, for, for spin one, that is, this is the guy that comes from a Yang Mills vertex. Whereas this guy is the thing that comes from a Chern Simons vertex. Now, in topologically massive gauge theory, the vertex is just the Yang Mills vertex plus the Chern Simons vertex. And that tells you that this guy, which is the Chern Simons vertex, must be proportional to the um, Yang Mills vertex on shell. And this is exactly true by the equations of motion. But when you just bootstrap it like this, just by little group scaling, you find that because there are two things you can write down that are invariant under little little group, um, you know, with the correct mass dimensions, etc. These things are just equal by the Schouten identity, and that's just reflected by the equations of motion if you do it like this. Um, I, I should also point out that you should see, well, uh, hopefully Mariana's going to talk about it in her next in the next talk. Um, but these guys showed um, this thing by the equations of motion, and you can use this to to derive the four points and five points and show that they um, respect BCJ duality in gauge theory and gravity. Uh, oh yeah, and the other thing is that for spin one, Bose symmetry enforces that this is in fact a gauge theory and that these guys have to be uh, FABCs. Um, so yeah, it has to be some yang Millsy type theory that they come from. Okay, so we can also build um, amplitudes in for matter coupled particles, so anions. Um, oh yeah, and also just to say, we could have we could have just seen those things by dimensionally reducing. I think I already pointed that out. Um, so we can use these x variables that hopefully some of you are familiar with. If you're not, it doesn't really matter. But x can be defined as um, something that acts on one of these guys. Uh, well, this is how it's defined in four dimensions, and we can just do our dumb dimensional reduction and turn, turn this into a bar and uh, in the, choosing the same gauge. So dotting in a um, P bar on this side, and we find that we get a three particle amplitude that's very much the same as the three particle amplitude in four dimensions, except now we're in this topologically massive three dimensional uh, regime where this you might recognize as being u dot the polarization vector that I had a couple of slides earlier. Um, and we want to use these to try and understand some sort of double copy. Incidentally, you can also bootstrap the, the uh, gravity guy, which is, is just x squared uh, with the re relevant coupling. Um, so we want to we want to look at the impulse for um, two anions scattering off each other, exchanging a topologically massive gauge boson. So the way we're going to think about it is that we've got some really heavy uh, particle that we want to probe, and we're going to probe it by throwing in some really light particle. So, and the the mass of this gauge boson is going to be much much smaller than any of the external masses. And in fact, the mass of the probe particle is also going to be much smaller than the mass of this, this heavy guy. Um, we can do the same thing in gravity. So we take those three points that I derived two slides ago. We mash them together over a massive propagator. And we find, well, these are the, these are the amplitudes. Uh, and we find an amplitude that looks like this. So we've got to expand this x1 and x2. But before we do that, um, Let's look at the how you get the classical guy. So to get the classical guy, um, you compute the, the impulse by looking at the field strength dotted with uh, the uh, velocity vector of the probe particle. So we're just going to take this guy to be the origin for simplicity. Um, 
plug this into the equation of motion to find uh, and, and solve for uh, the field strength. After some algebra, you find out that it looks like this. Um, I'm going to run through this because not particularly enlightening this particular calculation. I just want to point out some relevant features. Um, but after a bit of work, you find that the impulse from the field theory looks like this. And the amplitude side, we need to expand x1 over x2. This is the general expansion uh, of the sky. And okay, so we need to plug it into this formula that I briefly flashed on the slide before, which is this formula, which is derived in this KMOC paper. We've just ad adapted it for three dimensions. So we just need to plug the amplitude into this guy to get the, the same thing as we got here. So we expand this x1 over x2, plug in the amplitude, and we see that we get exactly the same thing. Um, OK, that's all well and good. Now we've got to think about what happens when we, when we take a double copy. Before I do that, uh, a little aside about Einstein gravity in two plus one dimensions. So I want to think about, uh, so it's well known that there are no gravitons in two plus one dimensions. Um, however, there is scattering in two plus one dimensions, even uh, in, in gravity, in Einstein gravity. So I want to think about just a particle at the origin, um, which gives you a, a, a Ricci scalar that looks like this. And space time is absolutely flat everywhere except for this point of the origin. So this is a conical singularity. And if you plug this in uh, to the topologically massive gauge theory equation, uh, sorry, Einstein equations, not topologically massive gravity equations, Einstein equations, and solve for h, you'll find that it looks like this. Um, and you can derive an impulse in the usual way by plugging this guy in, integrating over the geodesic, and you find this guy. Now this guy is distinctly non-zero. So this tells you that if you scatter two particles, or you, scatter, uh, uh, you, you throw a probe in with a particle at the origin, you do get non-zero impulse, right? However, crucially, this guy tells you there's no Newtonian potential because as soon as you take the rapidity to zero, this guy uh, dies, right? That'll be important later on. Okay, now back to the double copy. Um, so anions have a gravitational counterpart, gravitational anion, and we're going to look at exactly the same situation, but now on topologically massive gravity. So we just have a point mass at the origin, but now we've got this additional cotton tensor, which is the uh, comes from the uh, topologically massive part, and this has got some solution. It's not very important what it is. Um, again, I just want to point out some salient features. So we take this complicated looking thing, plug it into this, do the relevant computation. We find this thing. OK, now you might notice there's this red two that I clearly want to highlight. Right. So that's going to be important. And we want to ask the question, can we get this guy by just looking at the double copy of the gauge theory gully? So the double copy is given by this, right? You just square the gauge theory guy, change the couplings, blah, 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 right? You get this. Plug this in, and it looks very similar to the last guy, except there's no two here, right? We've lost the two somehow. So what's going on? So to answer this question, we're going to look at the massless limit in both cases, in the case where there's a two and in the case where there isn't a two. So we're just going to characterize that by n, because in the massless limit, you get this uh, cos 2w minus either 2 sin squared w or just 1. And when n equals 1, which is the case that you get from the double copy, we find that the massless limit of this guy, this sin squared w, uh, comes from the conical singularity that we saw in pure Einstein gravity, right? Um, 
but you've also got this cosh 2w guy right um if you sum these guys up with n equals one you'll find that that you get cosh squared w which is kind of what you'd expect from the dimensional reduction of just graviton scattering or whatever in, in four dimensions and it turns out that this is the the dilaton plus this purely topological massless graviton so we find that that's what's the that's what the limit is uh, the massless limit of the double copy if you take the massless limit of just topologically massive gravity you find that you just get the dilaton so there's no cosh term here but because of the result of this paper where they looked at what happens if you just take a point charge in uh, two plus one dimensions and you decide to uh, square it and look at the, the resulting double copy they find this cosh squared w so there is a distinction between topologically massive gravity and uh, and the double copy. So it turns out that the double copy is topologically massive gravity plus some extra massless graviton, something like that. Okay. The other thing that's very uh, interesting about, well, before I move on, I should ask if there may be any questions. No? Okay. The other thing interesting about topologically massive theories is that anions, particles that are matter particles that are coupled to topologically massive gauge bosons or gravitons, um, act as solenoids, as in they have charge and some flux. Okay, they have a charge and some flux going through them, and they give rise to an Aronov Bohm phase. So uh, we can derive this phase from the scattering amplitude um, in terms of the four-point amplitude um, by looking at a Wilson loop. So the, the way you think about this is you've got some particle at the origin and you've got a, you, you do a Wilson loop around the origin um, and you'll find that you will have picked up some phase or your wave function will have picked up some phase. Turns out you can write this guy in terms of a four particle amplitude times this strange sine of q dot b and if you want the details of how we derive this you can read our paper about it um, and the interesting thing to notice is that because of this sine q dot b any even function of q uh, doesn't doesn't contribute so we just look at the odd functions of q which is for example this guy uh, we plug this guy in and we find that the wilson loop reduces ultimately to this okay there's a plus minus here but that's kind of irrelevant um and the aronov bohm phase is um found by taking the so-called churn simons limit so the churn simons simons limit is basically you just make the gauge uh, field infinitely heavy so that it's purely topological um but you keep this ratio of e over m fixed and if you do this, you find that the Wilson loop uh, reduces to this thing, which, as it turns out, is exactly the Aronov bone phase for the uh, uh, anion in gauge theory. Uh, and if you want to take the double copy of this guy, it's obviously kind of trivial. You just take, you know, we know how to do this. You just take E goes to kappa E mu or whatever, right? You find this and you find this relativistic um, phase which in the non-relativistic limit which is where this just becomes uh, m squared i should say m squared this should actually be m1 m2 i suppose um but then this guy exactly agrees with the results derived in 1990 in these two papers okay uh change gears now slightly and talk about um the 3d equivalent of the vial double copy so um the vial double copy relates uh, exact gauge and gravity solutions and there's no reason to ask there's no reason not to ask uh, if there's a 3d topologically massive equivalent of this guy so in four dimensions um 
we can build curvature spinners by hitting them with a um, infilled van der Vorden symbol. And for any of you that saw Sylvia's talk, she went through this a little bit. Um, so you can make the electromagnetic. Uh, these are called Maxwell spinners, and it's dual. And then you can make the vial spinners um, by contracting with the, the vial tensor. Um, and these are typically thought of as self-dual and anti-self-dual, or maybe the other way around. Um, and in this form, when you've written these guys down, you take one of them and you find that the vial double copy is, is expressed like this, uh, as written down by these guys in 2018. There's a problem, which is that the vial tensor is exactly zero in three dimensions. So you've got to ask the question, what's the uh, equivalent of these guys? Um, so we're going to do that by looking at it from the perspective of amplitudes. So in, in three dimensions, um, everything can basically be written as vectors because we've got this, this dual field strength vector. And we can just take this guy and hit it with a, a, a sigma alpha beta. Again, we use the SL2R representation that we wrote down few slides ago and that will define for us a curvature spinner um, but of course we can think about this guy in terms of a scattering amplitude in the far future um, if we use the k mock formalism and write it in this seductive form um, we hit it with the uh, this sigma as I said and we find this curvature uh, written in terms of the scattering amplitude. In topologically massive gravity, the free equations of motion have this cotton tensor in, and this cotton tensor kind of plays the role of the vial tensor, uh, as in it, it tells you about conformal flatness and that sort of thing, but now in three dimensions. Um, and we can write this guy in terms of the graviton, um, in this case, into the under gauge, and given that this seems to be the sensible candidate for the double copy, we'll do the same thing as we just did for the um, gauge theory case. And we'll uh, mode expand this and plug it into the KMOC uh, integral. Uh, by the way, how much time do I have left? Um, I, let's see, you have about uh, 20 minutes, like 15 okay. before questions. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, right, so we can plug in the value that we have for C mu nu written in terms of H mu nu. We can plug this into this integral and we find um, now a gravitational scattering amplitude. So this is again, this is the same amplitude that, well, this is an amplitude involving two sources and a, or one source and a, and a graviton. Um, and again, plugging in the polarization vector, we find this guy. Uh, okay, after lots of sharpening, whatever. So we find four copies of the spinner and a gravitational amplitude, whereas in the gauge theory case, we found two copies of the spinner and a, a gauge theory energy. So in the last few slides, we looked at uh, anions coupled to gauge, gauge bosons and gravitons. Uh, and we can reuse those same amplitudes, plug them in in this case, and find the curvature spinner for a scalar anion coupled to a gauge boson. And this is what you get. And we can do the same thing for a graviton. And this is what you get. And you might have kind of just naturally guessed these things, right? Because this is just some on-shell integral. It's the real part of some on-shell integral. Um, you've got an amplitude which has some particular little group weight. You know, as I told you, these guys have little group weight plus a half, 
but this thing has you know uh you, you well you need something with this many free spinner indices so you just multiply by that many spinners right you do exactly the same thing in the gravity case so you get something of the right weight um okay um so in the paper we show that you can get these guys by directly uh starting with oops by directly starting with uh the field theory uh and you know doing these plugging in the correct screens functions and the boundary conditions all that stuff and you land on exactly the same thing i didn't want to put it in this presentation because it's a bit much but just to say these things do match the direct field theory calculations uh, and you can read the paper for more details um, and this kind of suggests that there's a, a momentum space double copy for these guys right because we've just seen that the, the stuff in the integrand um, well the, the amplitudes double copy um, and we've seen that you just double the number of spinners. So it seems like there should be some sort of momentum space double copy. Um, so we define the momentum space version of the, the cotton spinner by, you know, as its Fourier transform, as this on-shell Fourier transform. And then you find that the, the momentum space vial spinner is just given by, you know, m times a bunch of spinners times the, the scattering amplitude whereas the gauge theory momentum space curvature spinner is just given by two spinners times the um gauge theory amplitude and you see that then this scalar well we could we you should also think about a scalar right um you know if you if you didn't have any spinners at all you would just have presumably some amplitude right uh, so we just call that amplitude s because we don't really know what it is but it's defined in exactly the same way as these guys um and this is just because we know that in the vial but in the, the vial double copy you have this s in the denominator so we're just motivating it in exactly the same way and we find this momentum space double copy um which is again just given by two two of these guys but now we have to multiply by this m divide by two and we get this guy okay we now want to look at a position space example because it's all very well to have a momentum space double copy but why not position space double copy um so if you saw Cara's talk yesterday she was talking about this Kerr shield double copy um we can look at that in in exactly the same way in two plus one dimensions so we're going to think about well, actually this is fairly generic to any number of dimensions but let's just talk about it in two plus one um so in kerr shield coordinates we can write a plane wave in, in this form where this is some function to be determined uh, where these are null so-called kerr shield vectors um, and they're derivatives of u u being some light cone coordinate so by light cone coordinate i mean something like t minus x or t minus y or however you want to orient your light cone and then we just take this guy and we plug it into the topologically massive gauge theory uh, sorry topologically massive gravity equations of motion um, and we find this equation of motion um, we're going to take x to be you know greater than zero for simplicity and if we do that uh, we find this as a solution if we didn't do this we just find whoops if we didn't do this, we'd just find some other solutions with heavy side functions and stuff. And I didn't really want to uh, include that. So assuming this, we find that this is a solution to this differential equation. Um, and these are not particularly interesting solutions. So, you know, this is really the only one. So we assume that C1 and C2 are zero. Um, on the gauge theory side, we've got to solve the equation of motion for the um, dual field strength uh, and this is solved by um, something of this form right so 
clearly something that looks quite like the single copy of the other guy. Uh, so <clears throat> we find that plane waves are automatically a solution of um, the Kerr shield double copy, uh, and that the, the scalars given by this guy just with no vector, right? I should also say I hope Mariana might talk about some of this stuff in the next talk, but we'll see. Um, and we can look at the spinner form of this and see if if really this uh, does give us this cotton double copy as we claimed. So, you know, taking taking this F tilled and hitting it with sigma, uh, we find that this is the Maxwell spinner. Um, the cotton spinner requires slightly more work because, you know, we plug in these uh, two things and we hit them <coughs> uh, with the same set of spinners. But you find that what you get is you get this X, you know, just from just from taking the derivative of this H, which is which is roughly this e to the minus mx, um, you get this X hat acting on L. Um, but because of this delta function. This delta function sets x hat acting on l to just the absolute value of x times l. So you find this uh, four identical spinners in the in the cotton sensor. And this tells you because of like the Newman Penrose thing, um, or oh, classifications, that this guy has to be some type n solution in two plus one dimensions. Um, uh, and this clearly uh, double copies. You see, you take this, you're going to get a, a, an m squared, but this guy's got an m cubed, so you need, need to multiply it by m. You've got this factor 2 here, which you need to get rid of, so you divide it by 2. This gives you exactly the um, position space version of the, the cotton double copy that we derived, the momentum space version of uh, in the last um section and that is roughly all i have to say um so i will just say there's there's lots of stuff still to do in topologically massive uh theories and the double copy uh some of which is probably simpler in two plus one dimensions and some of which is probably a lot more complicated um and i just leave these things up to just say there's some you know interesting stuff being talked about at this workshop and probably you can think about a lot of it in terms of these topologically massive theories in two plus one dimensions and everybody should start thinking about it thank you very much thanks for that very nice talk um do we have any questions Uh, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so something I, I don't fully understand yet um, is first you showed for your double copy with onions that you needed like an extra massless graviton on the double copy side when mm -hmm. you did it for the impulse. Yeah. Uh, and then for the cotton double copy, you mentioned that you can also look at scattering like from onions in the three-point amplitudes and then construct your field strength and so on. And in mm -hmm. that case, you don't need anything extra. On the... Yes. So, uh, I, I, so I imagine that that's because it just looks at um, the radiative part, right? Because um, the in the anion scattering, we were looking at uh, two to two scattering. So there's some propagating modes. And then you have to think about all of the propagating modes. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the uh, the way that we formulated the cotton double copy is we just looked at the three particle amplitude. So it's fixed to only be an on-shell uh, topologically massive gauge boson or topologically massive graviton. So if there is some diloton, you'd have to add it or, or some extra graviton, you'd have to add it right by hand. Um, but yeah, whether or not you can recover this other stuff, I don't, I don't know. Because clearly, you know, in this case, um, the cotton double copy uh, vanishes in the massless limit, right? Yeah. 
whereas for anions it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is because of these extra modes, which, which are not being... So it's basically also like a three-point versus four-point. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. cool.